Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Very good. So, Vahid Morgan, good to see you. Uh, so, it looks like, uh, I think Susan said she wouldn't be coming in. And does anyone have any updates before we start? I think I, I mentioned, um, not in Devo Worm, but there's going to be a, a advanced microscopy course at the workshop at, um, at Berkeley this week. Okay. So it looks like a, a lot of really interesting speakers. So uh, re really excited to, uh, it, it's, it's the one really big technical gap I, I feel like I have. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, absolutely important in terms of molecular cellular, well, absolutely important in terms of cellular, um, multicellular work for, for imaging, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, um, well, it's like, it's not even just imaging, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, being able to track what you're doing <laughs> at that scale. Yeah. So. It looks, looks like a really interesting set of topics, and um, so I, th I think I posted the. the I, I think there's a program attached to what I posted there, and um, um, could could you know let, let me know if anything's of particular interest in terms of uh, taking notes or things like that. Hello, everybody. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Thanks, Morgan. For that. Hi, Bahid. How are you? Hi. Hi, thank you. Hi, fine. Do you have anything, to, any updates? or? Uh, for today? Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, I've been uh, in contact with um, like Gordon for some works. Uh, and the other one we were talking about, I was just uh, a little... Uh, Waiting somehow for 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 the data that we are talking about. We need some uh, lower stage data. Uh, if you have any papers that uh, could suggest there are maybe some electrophysiological data uh, in addition to the lower stage of the silicon, so I can uh, work uh, a little deeper on, on the paper I discussed last week. But if not, I have to do some review papers on uh, some uh, simulations that, or some uh, comparison between the uh, artificial neural networks that derive from the C elegance uh, as we talked. But my, uh, my perfection, the, what is more interesting, more interesting for me is to be able to simulate those larval that I was, I was talking about so that uh, we could have uh, different. Uh, if if we have uh, any type of data that could uh, represent the different like physiological characteristics of this elegance in different life level stage, I could uh, actually work on that type of paper much better than something like uh, just a review paper. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I I guess I shared uh, the draft with you so. At that, uh, at, at the part of the graph that I wrote some questions, if you had any, uh, if you have seen uh, so far any references that uh, contain, uh, even if it contains some uh, uh, plots that could be digitized, uh, that would be useful as well. Uh, something like uh, the main paper that I discussed in, in the draft, but uh, in other larval stages of uh, yeah. So, for example, uh, we say if there are, for example, lot four steps, that uh, the movement of, of the elegance is going to be uh, to get mature uh, as uh, the elegance is uh, somehow uh, grows up. Uh, that could be uh, something that could uh, actually be worth it. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I, and there should be uh, getting feedback here. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So yeah, oh, let me see if I, there we go. I think that's, it's just the microphone. Uh, so yeah, there's, uh, I think there's some data on electrophysiology in the larval worm. I don't know exactly where it is. I know there's a good set of data sets on synapses that reconfigure during uh, the larval, different larval stages. I know there's some work on um, like the Dower stage, and I think there's some electrophysiology on that, but I have to check on um, some of the, you know, I have to go check and see what's actually available because generally the C. elegans community is pretty good on, you know, making data available and having things sort of aligned in a way that's, you know, allows you to take multiple data sets and put them together. So um, I'll have to check into that. I'm going to talk today a little bit about like the timing of <clears throat> embryogenetic development. Uh, next week, maybe I'll talk about larval development. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and actually, well, I guess we, we, we could just start with uh, just having three or four data uh, would be enough. For example, uh, uh, the data in the, in the uh, for example, fourth day of uh, the Seragas state, Lava State, in the, for example, eighth day, it's something specific like this. Uh, I mean, something that could be an average of the movements in, uh, for example, uh, studying 100 C elegans in their fourth day, in their, for example, eighth day or fifteenth day, something like that. Some specific data that could be uh, actually uh, discriminated between four or five different uh, days of, of its life, and so uh, then we could uh, uh, simulate those uh, movements and so conclude that's how uh, the uh, developments are uh, are affecting those parameters that are that we are studying. Yeah. Yeah, that would be good, and uh, so. Uh, yeah, well, I'll I'll try to see what we can put together. I actually looked at your document, and you had some pretty nice uh, sort of outline, a plan of attack, and maybe some questions. Uh, would you mind maybe sharing your screen and bringing up that document real quick? Right now? Well, yeah. Okay. And one more thing, uh, we have been discussing uh, one more subject with Dr. Gordon during the past because as you know, he's working on uh, uh, some uh, actually cancer phenomena yeah. and some methods for uh, uh, yeah, uh, the growth of uh, cancer tumors, etc. Yeah. Uh, I was yeah. I, I I was thinking that if, if that could be possible as well, we we could also study some uh, similar uh, patterns in the development of the cancer tumors or cells uh, as and the development of the uh, actually embryogenetic uh, studies are being discussed in, in the C. elegans community. So, if there is any uh, relation or any study that has been uh, has been done, some similarities, especially on the uh, on, on the I know that some years ago, I guess two or three years ago, uh, the, there were a Nobel Prize for discovering the the Watch of the cell uh, growth and uh, development yeah. for, for, for proliferation. Uh, proliferation. So uh, I, I was suggesting actually to Dr. Garland that if there could be uh, any uh, similar idea that uh, that could be studied, in that type of watch that is actually somehow uh, uh, some uh, we know that some uh, cells, some cancer cells. Are uh, getting uh, uh, are growing due to some uh, unrestricted 
proliferation. So if there could be any, uh, if we could uh, somehow work on, on, on the type of the gene that's uh, actually due to some mutation or causing uh, those type of cancers, similar to how uh, a cell uh, in the embryogenic level is, gro is growing up, uh, so that we could uh, stop uh, uh, that kind of thing from uh, uh, somehow uh, being expressed as well. Yeah, yeah. Is there any uh, studies uh, in, in Silicon with that uh, type of approach to the, to the uh, actually how the cancer is growing up, how the cancer tumor is growing up, or, or something like that? Do you know any such studies? If, if that Yeah, so uh, I don't think there's anything in C. elegans per se. We have, uh, you know, people who study differentiation in, say, like mammals uh, and, you know, in mouse and human, and they do a lot of studies of directed differentiation. And some of those studies you can actually, you know, that there's sort of an allied area of like cancer research because if you, it turns out that some of the same pathways for like cell mortality and uh, and uh, pluripotency can also lead you down a cancer pathway. So depending on, you know, if the cell goes down, you know, there's some, there's some dysregulation in the cells program that, you know, it goes down one pathway versus another. Sometimes it uh, goes down, uh, you know, a pathway towards pluripotency. Sometimes it goes down a pathway towards differentiating into some type of cell, and sometimes it goes down the cancer pathway. So those, you know, there it just depends on how different genes are expressed or upregulated, and maybe the environmental conditions, etc. Uh, so th there, there are a lot of studies there. I don't think people have spent too much time in C. elegans looking at that for a number of reasons. But uh, you know, that I mean, you know, we do that in the group. We bring in things from C. elegans and from other species, and we do like comparative studies. We've done a couple of those, and that might be useful. Uh, there might be some limited utility in that, but it's still worth, you know, looking into and seeing what kinds of data sets we can put together. I mean, uh, for example, uh, if you suppose that there is some type of similar, some, some similar process in C. elegans proliferation that uh, looks like the cancer, for example, if uh, a normal C. elegans is going to be uh, proliferated at some stages, at some time. Uh, is there any study, have you ever seen any study that, uh, that could suggest that uh, a cancer, uh, uh, C. elegans is growing, growing up uh, more than usual, something like that, which looks like, uh, for example, a, a cancer tumor or not? Um, have you ever seen something like that in C. elegans? I've, I've uh, not. I'm not familiar. I don't think so. I think it's largely like you have defined mutants that can have different mutations. Uh, you can have, you know, some dysregulation that leads to developmental, uh, you know, uh, like where different cells are knocked out or something. You have other types of uh, weird things going on with respect to metabolism, but I don't know of any... I, they don't get tumors in the same way that we get tumors. So it might, there, there's some uh, homolog, uh, homologous genes that might be involved too. But other than that, I don't, I don't think, I don't think C. elegans would be a good model for cancer, but I do think there's like a, there's some interesting questions you could ask about uh, growth and development in terms of cancer, because cancer is basically a, a dysregulation of growth and development. So, you know, if those genes are regulated in the wrong way, you know, it can lead to, uh, you know, uh, aberrant phenotypes, as they call them. But yeah, I, I, yeah, it'd be interesting to look into the literature and see what people have done. I'm not really familiar with anything, though. Yeah, I try to search for and some, uh, I guess that could be a question, as you said. Is there any similarities, or have, has anyone seen uh, some type of maybe a toxic environment that 
could cause some like cancer in silicones. Uh, any type of such uh, studies, I will yeah. look as well and uh, let them to know if there is any, there have been any yeah. such studies. I know people do mutagenesis screens in C. elegans. That's where they take like a toxic chemical and expose the C. elegans to the toxic chemical. And then they just see what they can get in terms of inducing mutations. So you get a lot, you know, you can generate a lot of mutations that way. But I'm not, I don't know if people have actually reported anything related to like, uh, you know, what, what the cons, like if they found any weird things with respect to that. I think it's just like screening embryos to see if they have certain mutations and getting those mutations. And they either like just basically die or they develop. So that a lot of the mutations are going to be embryonically lethal. Some won't be. And, and those are the ones that you can maybe, uh, you know, get some, you know, target mutations. In. But yeah, I mean, there, may, there may be some interesting information in that literature. So. So yeah, that that sounds really good. Uh, thank you. Okay, this see my. Sorry, I guess. Um, okay. Uh, actually, this was uh, what we were talking about last week, uh, and uh, these were two main questions I had in mind. That if there are uh, that type, then some data like these, uh, then uh, then I could actually uh, uh, delve into uh, one question, which was. Uh, how we could uh, study and simulate C. elegans movement in different larval states or in different differential states of, of the C. elegans. Uh, these are actually maybe three, four or five, uh, could be maybe four or five different stages of the movement. Uh, if we say, for example, in, uh, in humankind, we have, for example, uh, toddler, then we have uh, a baby, and then we have, for example, a teenage and, uh, and uh, adult and old people, something like that. If we could have some similar uh, study of, of the movement of C. elegans for uh, these uh, different types with respect to the uh, electrophysiological data like this, and also the recording of the movement, we could then co uh, correlate those data and uh, Maybe we could derive some uh, new models, new developmental model that uh, that uh, could uh, something like that could actually uh, better understand uh, the different parameters that are involved in, in such a model. But uh, I guess we have uh, for this model we have only nine different parameters like um, these, and so in that way we could uh, understand how different. Um, models, both structural and also uh, from a behavioral point of view, uh, how these different parameters could be related to those uh, actually uh, uh, different uh, differential states that we are talking about. And after that, we could maybe uh, also uh, have some artificial neural network uh, model based on these uh, differentiated, dif differentiated uh, states. So uh, these are the main questions I had in mind. Uh, so would be glad if you uh, encounter any data for uh, for these requirements. Uh, I maybe could start delving into uh, this study. Otherwise, uh, I was looking for some uh, references to to have a historical view to the, to the development of. Artificial neural networks derived from C. elegans, or uh, vice versa, or we can or we could say uh, how we could better simulate uh, the uh, uh, one behavior, for example, the locomotion of C. elegans from uh, from its uh, from the parameters and uh, the, the uh, similar or the uh, somehow. Uh, the equivalent uh, circuit diagrams and its mechanical uh, uh, representation. So these are the two main uh, goals I had in mind for uh, writing this graph. Uh, I gathered some, uh, uh, as you see, some references for for the for the review part. Uh, so 
Meanwhile, if I could find some interesting data as well, I, I would delve into the second question uh, after that. Uh, th there are some key, maybe, uh, references uh, during my uh, queries. Uh, I actually asked some of the from ChatGPT. I uh, started with uh, getting some help from ChatGPT. I sorted some uh, key references during uh, this study and then uh, try to have a, chron a chronological review into the nervous system of the Lopenza in C elegans. And uh, I, I again try to uh, get some information that those chronological levels, uh, what type of studies actually have been done in that uh, chronological uh, review and uh, so to uh, make some summary from uh, that type of data uh, and then I again uh, try to understand uh, what type of actually artificial neural networks could be uh, could be uh, derived from uh, that type of data and study and simulation. For example, if we, uh, if we consider some uh, maybe great works that have been done in uh, regarding to the modeling the behavior in, uh, and, and also and so deriving the artificial learning from uh, a simple model, how the simple model has been uh, <coughs> actually gets more complex as uh, as the studies during uh, the decades of 1960 uh, and until now has been uh, as we get uh, actually more complex and complex during uh, this history. Uh, Again, I, I try to uh, have some references, some key references, right. and try to uh, again ask uh, some more questions to uh, get this to um, somehow play with this question and get it more uh, uh, comprehensive. Yeah. Uh, I, I try to find some, also some uh, maybe main study that uh, that have been uh, uh, somehow directly affected the, the uh, some main artificial neural networks uh, in uh, in the past. For example, the, the work by uh, uh, Dr. Koch, uh, I, uh, I, I guess I found it one of the most impressive ones in 1981, 89. I couldn't actually find the, this paper. Uh, it was a little uh, old and uh, I didn't have many access, but uh, this was one of the main papers that I, I, I was interested in because uh, it seems that uh, they have done something great. Uh, some maybe uh, actually after, uh, of course, after some uh, great works that have been done by uh, people like uh, uh, Brenner and uh, Dr. White, John White, etc. Uh, these were something that, uh, with regard to artificial neural network studies uh, and simulation of uh, neural networks uh, could be maybe uh, some initial points to look into uh, the, uh, the simplest model of C elegans uh, at the first place, C elegans uh, um, I, I, I mean neural circuits of the C elegans and then uh, how the neural networks of the C elegans have been Get more the simulation of neural networks. The elegans have been uh, gets more uh, sophisticated. So these were again uh, the main questions and uh, the main papers that I uh, somehow derived from these studies and try to again compare them with the main uh, works uh, that uh, has been. Done during the uh, uh, actually uh, 
getting more and more sophisticated artificial network like neural networks in general. So that's it. And okay. uh, at the end, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Yeah. the end of the. Uh, the well, this looks great, yeah. Uh, trying to... Okay, so yeah, this looks great. Uh, so yeah, you covered a lot of literature there. You covered a lot of sort of next steps in that. Uh, one of the approaches you can use to sort of get at development, I mean, you know, you can obviously get data sets and work with those. Uh, larval development, we have more for larval development in like what you're looking for than in embryonic development. I mean, embryonic development is largely, you know, cell tracking data, gene expression data, et cetera. But we can also, you know, if we're, we want to build parameters of like a movement model, you know, what we can do is take what we have in the adult and take that model. And we know the circuits in the adult. We actually have pretty good papers on that, pretty good characterization of the process and, and what networks those are and just reverse that reverse sort of reverse i guess developmentally engineer it or something like that where you go back and you say what was there in the what's different in the larval stages that you don't see in the adult and so there are a lot of change there's a lot of synaptic plasticity in the lar different between the different larval stages so that's a that's a thing that you have to account for uh, we don't really know much about the ion channel or ion channel expression changes in, in development, in larval development. In uh, embry late embryonic development, it gets even more interesting because, you know, there is a lot of, like, your cells that you have, the developmental cells, the cells that are kind of differentiating into neurons, they're not quite connected yet, they're axons, and when they are, they're not quite working in the way that they would work in the adult. So, you know, we expect there to be even bigger changes in those cells, uh, you know, very early or very big differences between the late developmental stages and like the adult. But that's interesting because, you know, what is, what does it mean to be sort of wire, how does, what does it mean to wire up a connectome? What does it mean to have like a bunch of cells that are basically non-committed cells? You're not committed to a fate. And in C. elegans, they know what their fate is going to be because there's a deterministic program for most cells that, that says, you know, you're going to be this cell. But then what happens when that kind of gets turned on and you start to build this network? So that's the thing, you know, we can use these kind of inverse methods where we go to the adult and we look backwards and say, what's different in the embryo? And then we can kind of pull some of those out. Uh, what's interesting, too, is that in embryogenesis, we have these really sort of emergent networks. You know, they may not be fully functional as a connectome yet, but they're put, you know, they're being put together. And, you know, the idea, at least in, uh, in, you know, in principle is if you manipulate like that network early, if you perturb it somehow, or if you remove some of the cells, or if you have a defined mutant where some of those cells are knocked out essentially, where their function is knocked out, then that means that you're going to have an effect in the adult connectome. And I, I, I know there are a lot of defined mutants for C. elegans, and I, I'm not uh, familiar with one that's explicitly sort of perturbs the connectome, other than like maybe knocking out, you know, having an effect on certain circuits, like the movement circuit and things like that. So, you know, there's a lot of work on the adult movement circuit and. I know that like not only on the direct, you know, direct movement circuit of like forward and backward movement, but there was a paper that uh, I think I reviewed it last at the, towards the end of last year that talked about like all the, all the cells that kind of mediate a movement network. So you have a movement network that generates these forward and backward movements, and it involves maybe about five or six cells. And then you have the sensory uh, neurons that give a signal to those motor neurons that tell it where to move, you know, so you're moving relative to some stimulus. And then you have other cells that sort of mediate that process, maybe tune the movement 
and things like that. So there, there's a lot of, you know, connectomes are structured in a, in a lot of interesting ways. But um, yeah, then, you know, of course, then we have the data for larval worms, and I'm not really sure the state of the art there. I'm sure there's, uh, you know, I know that there's a synaptic data set. I know that people are working on looking at different developmental stages. Uh, you know, there's a lot of work, say, for example, on L1 arrest, which is a period where uh, you can freeze C. elegans in this uh, larval, the first larval stage, and you can keep it there for like two or three weeks. And, uh, you know, you can look at like what's happening early on. Um, you basically, uh, you know, you deprive it of food, like when it's in its, or you actually hatch the eggs and then you deprive it of food and it can stay in that state for a long time. Uh, but then you also have the dower uh, stage, which is from L2 to L4. And it's just an alternate a version of development where, you know, it's it's got like these adaptations for hunkering down in, in adverse environmental conditions. So it has a lot of adaptations there. And so, you know, you can study those variations on development, you can study development it's, or larval development itself, so. Is there any, because the, that was actually my first question in this uh, review paper, is there any uh, specific points that uh, would discriminate all these stages from a behavior like locomotion, for example, as we say, uh, at larval stage, L1, L2, L3, L4, uh, they are, for example, in, in, the, in, in the average, if the C. elegans is uh, living for, for example, 21 to 24 days, I guess. Uh, if the L1 is, for example, if this is on, I guess, uh, it was day two or three, yeah, something like that. Uh, do you have any specific days for those larval states? For example, L1 to L2 is day, for example, uh, two or three to, for example, day seven or eight, and something like that, yeah? We have, uh, uh, yeah, I think that's such average models. I think people characterize that, but you know, I can I'll show you in a little bit like what kinds of visualizations they can make for that. And I'd, actually, I'd like to see a certain type of visualization for that. But we have to go into the literature and like find the sort of the consensus timing for this because yeah. it's but, like people have kind of characterized it, and you know, yeah. so. But my main question is because uh, if, for example, we have L1, L2, something like that, that this is, uh, I guess this is something related to the size of the, the C. elegans, yeah? But is there any specific uh, larger stage for, for, for its neural networks? For example, we could say that like L1 that is happening when the size of the uh, C. elegans is one fourth of millimeter, for example, uh, we, have a, we have a similar larger stage that for example, L1 or something like that, for its neural circuits that looks like a toddler in, for example, in, uh, in humankind, for example, or a teenage in humankind. Is, is there something, any specific timings for, for, for the, for the uh, development of neural networks to see in the last uh, Well, I, I think by the time it hatches, the, I mean, the neural network doesn't work exactly the same way as human neural networks, uh, you, it's largely sort of fixed in the L1, you know, so you, what you get in L1 is going to be what you get in the adult in terms of neurons. The connect, the synaptic connections, however, are very plastic, and you get differences in the synaptic connections. And the, that data set exists. There are some data sets for that exist. Um, I'll show you some, I did some experiments on that uh, data set. Um, then, you know, the L, the developmental stages refer to like a mult of the cuticle and, you know, how it, it you know, it basically goes through these stages of growth. Um, there's some interesting things with like what they call seam cells. So there's a post-embryonic lineage tree that has like seam cells and these are, uh, uh, you know, different types of cells on the periphery of the C. elegans. I don't know if they're can be explicitly connected to the connectome, but there's there's stuff going on there. So there are a lot of like a lot of different things uh, that we can tie to the connectome. I don't know how much far we want to go out though. Um, I mean, in terms of the core connectome, I think it's largely uh, you know synaptic changes and maybe some ion channel expression changes. I know there's some gene expression data for 
larval stages as well. It might be interesting to see what's going on there. But that's a little bit harder to get at uh, <laughs> than the, uh, the the actual connectivity map. No, but uh, actually this is something if you are going to understand how the uh, mind of the worm works, if you are going to understand how our brain works, actually this is the main question maybe lots of us are looking for to see how the minds of us see elegance works because we, we are more interested in uh, our intelligence than the elegance one. But uh, I'm saying, uh, and as you know, we are, our aim somehow, lots of our, our uh, efforts here is to find out those uh, from a developmental point of view, to understand how uh, how could all these put together, and so educate uh, maybe younger ones or even ourselves that if a simple neural network is going to be uh, studied like this, from uh, for example, how the learning how how learning the process happens during the development of C elegance, like how learning of movement is happening inside a human kind. This is maybe a, a little simpler one, so you could both understand, you could listen to it, both understand that, that process or behavior, as well as educate those who are interested in some simple uh, models like C elegance to uh, how it could be. Uh, actually uh, simulated like this, for example, a neural network with lots of uh, nodes and connections uh, could be so simple in a C elegance with, uh, actually, uh, and the process of learning, of the locomotion, of feeding, etc. Uh, this is something uh, with a big picture I have in mind, uh, in mind plus uh, to uh, understand as well that uh, how maybe the process is working in a real life. Yeah. So let me share my screen. I'm going to go through some stuff that we've done, um, maybe some ways that we can visualize this or get the data together in a more organized way. So, okay, here we go. Um, so, So this is worm book. This is a good reference for looking at things, all things sort of consensus on C. elegans. So they have some maps of larval develop or of uh, embryogenetic development. So this is for epidermal and hypodermal morphogenesis. So this is from worm book. This is figure one uh, on the chapter on epidermal morphogenesis. This is like a map of the major events in morphogenesis. So this is from the time that the, uh, this is around the time that the embryo gets fertilized and stored. This is the first cleavage here. Then there's the four cell stage. Notice that they have the time here in minutes. So the four cell stage is 19 to 33 minutes after fertilization. You have the founder cells generated, which are those uh, eight cells that found the major lineages of C. elegans. So you get uh, like uh, three division events, and then you and this happens just before 100 minutes. So, this actually, this is uh, I think it's 100 minutes, right? Yeah, this is uh, so four cells happens at 19 to 33 minutes, you get down to maybe 85 minutes, and that's where your founder cells are generated. And then you have uh, the ingression of e daughters, which means they migrate around. The E daughters are the anterior and posterior oriented uh, cells from the E lineage. This has to do with, uh, you know, tissue. This is the beginnings of tissue formation. Uh, then we have gastrulation, which is 100, 100 to 250 minutes. So we have that stage in there. Then we have the first cell death a little bit after 200 minutes. So this is where some of the developmental cells die. And you see this in the lineage tree. Uh, we have major, major epidermal cells born around 230 minutes. The closure of the ventral cleft, which is in this area here. The dorsal intercalation, 290 to 340 minutes. Epidermal enclosure, 350 to 390 minutes. So you get these movements in the embryo. And then you get elongation, which is where you have this comma. It looks like a comma. 
which is just kind of like the head and the tail starting to pull apart and form the long worm that we know in the adult form. And so the elongation goes from 395 to 520 minutes. So we get this, uh, and then we get a bunch of other events, pharyngeal glands, pharyngeal pumping at 760 minutes. That's where we get this pumping of the pharyngeal gland, of the pharyngeal apparatus. And so this is, these are kind of the first stirrings of behavior. Uh, you know, some of these are autonomous behaviors. So you see a lot of muscle twitching, you see pharyngeal pumping, uh, and they're kind of being oriented to the nervous system at that point. And then at 800 minutes, which is do the math on that, um, that's not, you know, it's like maybe a half a day, you get hatch. You get a hatch from the egg into this L1 stage. And so after this, we get the L1 stage, the L2 stage, the L3 stage, and the L4 stage. So, this so my is, question is, is it any specific time that, for example, the first locomotion of uh, the three legs is detected, for example, if uh, in the, for example, in, in it starts from L4 stage, yeah? The first movement? Uh, it, it starts late in, in embryogenesis. Uh, I, I'll show you another figure where this is kind of put onto another timeline. And we'll see what that looks like. But it's, you know, this is all taken from the literature. So we have our knowledge of this is as good as the papers that are published. So, like, you know, it's it's well characterized. But I don't know if people have asked some specific questions uh, about movement, like the generation of movement. That That's something that, you know, it's like, I don't know if people have asked exactly that question. Like, when is the first, uh, like... Uh, goal-directed movement versus the first sort of autonomous muscle twitch or autonomous pharyngeal pumping. So that's a question no one's really asked. This is just from like different observations. Because uh, I guess this is uh, a really important question. Uh, if you are going to understand uh, what is happening at the first stage of uh, a behavior like locomotion and understand how uh, a neural circuit is going to be developed to uh, to uh, command the cell again to move for the first time, uh, you know, how how it how it is actually going to be uh, appear in, in, in the neural networks of cell against from development of point of view. This is my main question that I have for for a study like this. Uh, I, I'm trying to convey that uh, what kind of questions and data I'm looking for. So uh, this is this is exactly uh, what I'm. More yeah. So then there's hypodermal morphogenesis, which is this is a little bit less detailed this map, but basically it goes from zero to six hundred minutes, and it just shows some of these things in the uh, microscopy. So uh, you know you get this basically these stages of development, and then they show some uh, they show actually some neurons and their connections here. So this is, uh, or I guess not neurons, but this is, uh, anyways, this is a map of hypodermal morphogenesis. So uh, this, this is another way to visualize this. So you have these different stages and you just mark them off. And this is all from the literature, from microscopy. So the observations are based, you know, based on what people have seen, what they're looking for. I don't know, again, like if there's something on, I don't even know if, you know, maybe it's more philosophical until you actually simulate it. But to simulate it, you need to know kind of what's, what cells are there, what kinds of different things are going on in, in the late embryo and early um, larval stages. Uh, so they have this neuroinformatics paper. Uh, this was published by, you know, this was published in the journal Neuroinformatics. This is some work that we did on uh, synthesizing early developmental processes, uh, sort of in a computational way. We've done this. Uh, we've done this from uh, primary data. We've also done this using machine learning, in terms of extracting this out of uh, cell images. But this is a graph where it shows the different types of adult cells that sort of emerge in the connectome over time. So you know, you start with like at about 200 minutes of the first neurons, you start to get different. This is the hypodermal neurons here. This is IL, uh, IL cells. 
OL cells, uh, DV cells, and so forth. So this is kind of the emergence of these, these different cell classes and their number. So you can see that, you know, you have this network that changes its num its constituency. And if you were to take a slice of time, like at 220 minutes, you know, you would have a network that was formed, consists mostly of these H cells and the uh, hypodermal cells. Whereas later you would have, you would include other types of cells, intestinal cells and so forth, or INT cells. And so those would all kind of uh, emerge over time. So if you want to build a, 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 make some sort of network of cells, you would have to sort of think about, okay, this is the type of cell that's here at this time in development. And so each cell type has certain properties, certain gene expression profiles, certain functions. And so, you know, it, it, I don't know how useful that is for like a neural network, but it's definitely worth thinking about how those, and this happens in human connectomes as well, that are, you know, cell types, especially over embryonic development, they change their constituency from like precursor cells to mature neurons. And then we get this added step in humans of having, you know, regulation by sort of being in a certain environment, um, you know, cellular environment. So sometimes neurons can change their composition as they're near other neurons. Once they connect to each other, they start to affect each other's gene expression. And so the, the activity of the neurons changes depending on the parts, the constituents of their network. But this is an important point that you have different cell types in biology. You have different fractions of cell type. And that changes across uh, development. This is about, you know, this is by like maybe mid-embryogenesis from two to 300 minutes post-fertilization. Another figure we had from that paper was, you know, again, taking like from 200 minutes to 300 minutes, looking at this, all cells, which are like all developmental cells and terminally differentiated cells. And then noticing that, the number of terminally differentiated cells goes up from about 215 minutes to 300 minutes as a proportion of all cells. So the blue here, this blue bar is basically uh, all terminally differentiated cells plus uh, developmental cells. So at 200 minutes, everything is a developmental cell. At 300 minutes, this fraction of this blue line, of this uh, orange line, are terminally differentiated cells, and then the rest are developmental cells. As you notice, the fraction of developmental cells decreases because they're being converted into terminally differentiated cells. And then this one for B, and I don't remember what the legend, what the difference is here, but you get this, I think this is the connectome, this is overall, you get this increase in terminally differentiated cells that's greater than in general. In the embryo. So this is kind of an interesting point that, you know, you can look at that in terms of like, you might in a neural network, you might have a cell that's very general in terms of its function, or maybe it, it's basically non-functional, but it's there. So like, you know, you might in a neural network, you might, it might not have, a, it might be a weightless entity. So it's a unit that you just pass data through and you don't have any weight to it. And then eventually when it you know, becomes terminally differentiated, you might have a weight associated with that connection. You might also have some other specialized uh, processing that goes on. So it's important, you know, to have this kind of time course, think about yeah. how this process works. One more question that I'm going to, cla to clarify more was uh, the, the, the main point I'm going to start with. Uh, another uh, Example, I, I could say, for example, during hatching, uh, as you said, we know that from a mechanical point of view, if you are going to simulate something like that from a mechanical point of view, the hatching exactly takes place takes place where uh, the pressure of the, the uh, volume inside the egg is uh, as much as uh, the, actually is more than the, the uh, stamina of the uh, the shell of the egg. Okay. So mm -hmm. when when the, the body inside uh, an egg uh, is uh, is going to be to push 
that much pressure that could uh, be defeated the seven of the egg that the hatching is going to be play to actually to take place. So this is the exact moment of the hatching that could be, for example, as you said, during the 300 minutes after or 600 minutes, yeah, 300 minutes, for example, after uh, the, the first uh, 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 maybe for, for the creation. So uh, from that point of view, the, the mechanical model for movement, for the first movement could be somehow when uh, a sea elegance is uh, pulling or pushing that much pressure to the, uh, to the ground uh, underneath, that could make it the first movement. Uh, uh, actually, there are usually pulses. There are some, as you know, there are some period, periodic pulses yeah. inside the neural. Okay, is everyone else here still here? I think we lost the heat for a minute here. I'm still here. Okay, yeah. <laughs> just, just, just about to head out to take uh, kids to school there. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah I don't I, I've been listening. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I don't know when Vahid will be back, but yeah, he had some an interesting point, which was that you have this biophysics of movement in the sort of hatching. And so if we think about like what happens during hatching, you know, the, the, the C. elegans embryo is rolled up basically at that point. So we have like a, basically it's, it's reaching, it's sort of like, it's sort of like this where it's like rolled up. It's almost like a spiral. It's inside the egg. And then it breaks open. And then once the eggshell breaks open, you get this unfurling of the worm. So it unfurls and then it starts to move around. So this whole thing is kind of from these embryogenetic movements and then it elongates, but it elongates in the spiral. And then that spiral kind of breaks free once the egg is hatched. So there are a bunch of movements there. So, you know, there's a hatching physics. And I don't know if people have characterized this. It may not be characterized very well. There's also sort of the unfurling physics. So there's a sort of a, and I don't know if this is like a, a set of sort of, you know, reactive behaviors or if there's like, if the worm is actually trying to actively do this with its nervous system, much like it might move with the movement circuit. But this is stuff that we can find in the literature if we, uh, you know, are so inclined to go in that direction. Um, yeah, I don't think he's back yet. So yeah, he, he brought some interesting points. Uh, I have a couple other, the other paper that I wanted to go over with some of the figures is this Frontiers paper. So this was something I published uh, on my own. This is Raising the Connectome. And it really kind of took a lot of things out of the literature to put together a model of, uh, okay, so that's that figure a model of sort of uh, movement behaviors and, you know, how that fits into the embryogenetic development uh, framework. So you have this, this is something from that paper. It's a timeline where you have fertilization at time zero, the first terminally differentiated cells at 200 minutes, and then this NSY5 subnetwork, which is part of the movement network. The first cells appear around 270 minutes. Uh, you have the comma stage, you have the emergence of asymmetric gene expression and axonal outgrowth. So this is where we begin to have cells send axons out to, to make connections with each other. You have the initiation of the twitching phase, which is where you get these autonomous twitching movements. So this happens around 450 to 470 minutes. You get pharynx morphogenesis from 430 minutes to 760 minutes. So this is the site of the first pumping. So this this begins kind of when we start to see axonal outgrowth and this autonomous twitching. And then at 770 minutes, this gets put together at least in the pharyngeal subnetwork of the connecto. And it, it results in the efficient 
sort of efficient pharyngeal pumping. So, you know, you can think of a lot of these twitching behaviors as maybe non-goal directed or non, non-efficient. It could, you know, like I can move my finger by it, a muscle twitch, but it's not an efficient movement. It doesn't do anything that I want it to. It just twitches. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the, you know, you're moving from the sort of movement generation to some directed set of movements that do something functional. And then this is right before hatch. So we have some of this outline, and this is basically from the literature. So, you know, the idea would be to kind of think about from about 450 minutes of embryogenesis down to 770 minutes. That's where you get this. You can you have a case study there of like pharyngeal pumping and how this starts to go from being kind of a randomly generated set of movements to something coordinated. Um, then there are these other, so this is again, proportion and developmental cells. We saw that before. And then this, this is actually a map of this, uh, synaptic data set in, uh, larval development. So this is, uh, available, uh, on, I have access to it. You know, we can go through that data set, but basically it's the plasticity of synapses in larval development. So you get the you can actually go down to the birth time, uh, and you can look at the average number of synapses. You can actually look at this also over larval development, and see what the changes look like. Uh, this is it, we, the the data set that I'm working from has three uh, classes. We have transient synapses, we have developmental synapses, and then we have stable synapses. So the transient ones kind of get rewired throughout development. So you get like a transient uh, synapse is something that is active only for a little while and then goes away. And so you see a lot of those in certain part, part points in development. Uh, it doesn't really tell you why they're transient. It's just that they're, they don't persist. You get developmental uh, synapses, which are only really developmentally, you know, if you looked at the adult connectome, these synapses wouldn't exist, but they have developmental roles or they're in... They're there during development. And then the stable ones are those that are like maintained long term. So you might be able to find their analogs in, in the adult worm. And so there are these three different uh, stages. And again, without going back to the paper, you know, you can do these kind of analyses and look at specific, you know, uh, maybe like the motor circuit and see what's going on there. We didn't do that analysis for this paper but the, those data exist. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's definitely something that would be interesting to look into later as a thing that, um, you know, would be sort of the basis for this. So this, yeah, this is the figure here. So uh, these are actually, I guess, uh, okay, uh, these are presynaptic and postsynaptic. So in a nervous system, you have synapses that are uh, connections that are presynaptic leading into the neuron and then postsynaptic leading out. So there, that's what the differences are here. And so, you know, we can look at that. We can look at the timing of these. We can look at their sort of, if they're transient, developmental, or stable. So, um, yeah. Okay, Vahid's back. Are you Vahid? Yeah, I know. Uh, we lost power here for some uh, seconds and then came back. Yeah. I had no internet connection. Okay. Uh, okay. I guess I, uh, I, I could convey what, what I meant by uh, the first big bang of, <laughs> you can say, uh, the movement of the other guy. This is. Uh, 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 from uh, I was talking about the mechanical uh, simulation of of, such, uh, of of the first movement, like the hatching. Yeah. Uh, this would be similar one, but uh, as we know, there are uh, circular or uh, uh, regular periodic pulses inside uh, a telegram's neural network, which is actually at the end uh, goes to to the uh, muscle of cell and. Uh, and, and and they could be the final uh, actors, maybe. 
So uh, my question is that if there is, uh, if there is, uh, if there could be a model that could simulate whenever those impulses are making enough, uh, and and the maybe the the, uh, the muscle cells are as the, as the actors are uh, are strong enough that uh, the incoming pulses could make uh, some cells uh, uh, pushing uh, make them to push enough forces on on the uh, on, on the underground uh, surface, for example, uh, it is on on the earth. How much uh, pressure? How much pressure could be that uh, that force uh, uh, and gravity underneath that could make the first movement with some angle? So, to say. so if if we could calculate something like that, we could uh, uh, we could maybe go to the point that the first movement of the elegance is somehow uh, is taking place. This is a, a simulation point of view, a mechanical simulation point of view for for that type of developmental space. So I'm more looking specifically uh, to model something like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean that that would be, uh, you know, we have to kind of figure out from the literature where the uh, you know different things, you know, what those things are, what the parameters are, maybe. Um, I, don't... Not, I think you could also estimate that. It is possible to estimate something like this because we have the model for an adult. So if we could estimate that, how much force uh, could be enough to make the first push, that would oh, yeah. maybe, yeah, maybe the first uh, uh, the first estimation of the, uh, the needed uh, size of muscles, for example, or something like that. Like how much muscle pressure would you need, or how much muscle force would you need, and when would you need it? Like, would you need to do it repeatedly or whatever? Yeah, that'd be kind of interesting. <laughs> um, yeah. So I wanted to one last word about the timeline. So basically, if we look at development, we have or larval development, we have four stages. We have this L1, L2, L3, and L4. This is the adult. And then there, you know, the differences in the adult. They're all younger adults and older adults. And uh, I've also looked at sort of reproductively what these, you know, sort of differences in the adult stage. So the hermaphrodites, which are 99% of the worms are laying eggs. They lay their eggs in clutches. So they have like, they lay their eggs and then they stop laying eggs. And then they become sort of senescent worms and then die. You know, like that they die after maybe three to four days, sometimes longer, depending on what happens in the developmental stages here. But basically, you know, for L1, we have this L1 arrest, and that's where we just arrest. We can starve the eggs, and we can let the eggs hatch, and then they survive, and they persist in an L1 stage for like two weeks. Um, and then you can, like, measure what happens after they've had that that starvation experience. Basically, there's some plasticity maybe associated with that. Not necessarily phenotypic, but like in gene expression and things like that, it's well known that there's some met metabolic genes that go up and down as you, uh, depending on what genes you're talking about. At L2 to L4, we have this dower stage, which is where we have these protective uh, protective, uh, this protective plasticity that occurs in response to extreme environmental conditions. You can think of this as like diapause. And then you have uh, these seam cells that are born. So you have post-embryonic, uh, you have a post-embryonic lineage tree where these seam cells are born. And that post-embryonic lineage tree was also done by um, you know, by the same group that did the embryonic lineage tree. So they've kind of fit that in. So you can actually get that information. So, you know, in terms of like larval development, we have a lot of available information. We have timing. We have like, uh, you know, cell, sort of cell state information. We have information about synapses. And, you know, we, I don't know how much biophysics we have here, 
Um, there's certainly a lot of characterization of dower worms, L1 arrest, you know, seam cell morphogenesis. So we have a lot of things here. Maybe there are some uh, studies on like sort of the mechanics of movement throughout the larval worm, but we can also do the reverse engineering aspect where we look at the adult, maybe the young adult, and we kind of map that back to what's going on in the larval stages. Because the larval stages are just differentiated largely by different molts of the cuticle. So like as it grows, it sheds its cuticle, it builds a new one, and then you get this, if you eventually get to adulthood. So that's, I mean, that's a kind of diagram we maybe would like to have, sort of like this time course to populate it with different things that we know are going on, different data sets, and then say, okay, we can take the data that we have and, you know, simulate these different points in time. So we might set up a simulation for L1, L2, L3, L4, and then young adult, or maybe even one we could simulate, like pre-hatch uh, stuff going on, like right before hatch, and compare it with L1. So there are a lot of ways you can set that up and like make those comparisons. So yeah, Vahid, any words about any of that? <laughs> yeah, thank you. I was actually uh, making some notes inside the paper, what we are discussing. So uh, those miles, uh, I'm trying to uh, make uh, specify that what are those milestones that we are looking for for some simulation that, that I was taking some notes and I'm completing the questions that I've been listed in the graph model so that we could continue as we are uh, moving on. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah, I'm yeah. looking forward to seeing it develop the draft. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, and any type of uh, uh, suggestion, uh, I would be very uh, happy. You and or anyone else has any type of suggestion or references to recommend for uh, adding to those uh, and to try to extract data from those references would be very appreciated. Yeah, yeah that would be great. Yeah. All right, so uh, well, uh, did anyone else have anything they wanted to share? Uh, I don't know if Dick had anything he wanted to mention before we go. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Thanks. All right. So, well, thank you for attending. Um, that was a great overview by Vahid of some emerging work, and, you know, we'll keep working on that. Um, otherwise, have a good week. Thank you. Okay, bye. All right. All right. Now I'd like to talk about a paper that has particular relevance to some of the work on expansion and contraction waves as a collective phenomenon we call differentiation waves. So this is something that Richard Gordon has, has spent his whole career kind of uh, reinterpreting from the uh, developmental biology literature. And this is, uh, I think it's very informative also to some of the biophysics work we've been talking about. So this paper is called Spatial Constraints Control Cell Proliferation in Tissues. Uh, this looks like it's a German group, maybe with some people at Stanford, uh, people at Santa Barbara at the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics. And, you know, it kind of goes over this idea that cell proliferation is sort of the key to developing tissues. So if we go into the literature on differentiation waves, we have expansion waves and contraction waves. Expansion waves are waves of activity. Cells will increase their proliferative capacity, those cells will start to reproduce more and more. And so you get a whole area of the embryo that has more and more cells, maybe of a certain type, and you end up with the differentiation of a tissue. Conversely, you can have contraction waves, which are where there's a signal that goes across the number of cells, and it slows down their proliferation rate. So it has to do with cell cycle, it has to do with 
the control of cell division. And so we have this question of cell proliferation in the embryo and what's controlling that and what are the patterns of cell proliferation in space. So this paper is very relevant to that set of questions. And so why don't we read the abstract and go through the paper and see what kind of insights we can find. So the abstract reads, control of cell proliferation is a fundamental aspect of tissue formation and development and regeneration. Cells experience various spatial and mechanical constraints, depending on their environmental context in the body. But we do not fully understand if and how such constraints influence cell cycle progression and thereby proliferation patterns in tissues. So let's think about this in terms of our differentiation waves and the different types of waves we can have. So let's have an embryo here with a bunch of cells. Those cells divide from their mother cells, so we have a bunch of daughter cells here, and those cells communicate across space. So one cell can communicate with other cells and so forth. So we can have these waves of activity, indeed we have waves of activity throughout embryogenesis. Sometimes they're calcium waves, sometimes they're uh, chemical waves, sometimes they're other types of waves. And so you can interpret these waves as having sort of a control over cell proliferation or cell division. So as these cells divide, they do so at a certain rate. And we can sort of figure out that rate and figure out the differences in that rate over time and in different locations of the embryo. So for example, say there's a wave that continues throughout this part of the embryo, and that wave has an effect on the cells in that region that they slow down their uh, proliferation rate. So this region has slower proliferation than this region. That leads to some sort of differentiation between the two regions, this inner region and this outer region, and you get some sort of differentiation event and it forms a tissue, a distinct tissue. So it looks different, sometimes it behaves different. And that's sort of the logic behind differentiation waves. This rate then will become important in this paper as well, because what they're saying is that there's spatial constraints on proliferation rates. So they're actually looking at, you know, the spatiality of the embryo and maybe some constraints. So for example, migration patterns of cells or the number of existing cells in certain locations, the regions that, uh, you know, demarcate the embryo, so their previous differentiation events and so forth. So here we study the impact of mechanical manipulations on the cell cycle of individual cells within a mammalian model epithelium. By monitoring the response to experimentally applied forces, we find a checkpoint at the G1-S boundary that, in response to spatial constraints, controls cell cycle progression. What they mean by checkpoint at the G1-S boundary is that they have this model of cell cycle, and cell cycle has a number of phases they have a certain nomenclature for that. Some of the, one phase is G1 and another phase is S. And so cell cycle progression happens by these different phases becoming in sync or out of sync. In other words, if you, if you extend that phase or shrink that phase, you can affect what happens to the cell, how fast it proliferates. But also if it goes through apoptosis, or you know other things that can happen to the cell, and cell cycle. It, a lot of things are cell cycle mediated. Cancer is cell cycle mediated to an extent. Uh, differentiation, cellular reprogramming, etc. They're what they're doing here is they're experimentally applying forces and they're getting a systemic response in the cell cycle genes. So there are a whole bunch of genes that control the, the sort of the duration of each part of cell cycle and the transition from one cell cycle phase to another. We have these checkpoints, which are points at which there's some sort of input as to tell the cell whether to move to the next phase or not. So that's what they mean by checkpoint. So we find a checkpoint at the G1-S phase boundary that in response to spatial constraints. So these are spatial constraints in the embryo like we showed here. And remember, there are all sorts of forces acting on each cell. So 
the cell could have some sort of be in some sort of force regime or some sort of environmental situation where it needs to divide faster or divide slower. So there are all sorts of mechanical cues that are playing a role in shaping this wave and the extent of the influence of this wave and the extent of the influence of any one set of uh, develop, uh, division conditions or, or proliferation conditions. This checkpoint prevents cells from entering S phase if the available space remains below a characteristic threshold because of crowding. So what they mean by that is that if there's crowding in the embryo, so if there are too many cells in a certain region, and there's a mechanical signal that says we're crowded, we're all full, then that will send a signal back to the cell and tell it to not enter that phase of cell division and thus slowing the rate of proliferation. And this happens across all cells. So if there's crowding, we've talked about jamming phase transitions where you get you go from having like massive proliferation to this sort of jammed phase. And this happens in development a number of times. The, basically, this is describing that mechanism for how that works. There's also unjamming, which is interesting, and that can happen either due to migration or maybe due to this proliferation signal. This checkpoint prevents cells from entering S phase, so S phase is being mediated by these forces, which is in further mediated by sort of uh, sort of density conditions and maybe some other force conditions as well. Stretching the tissue results in fast cell cycle reactivation, whereas compression rapidly leads to cell cycle arrest. So basically, if you have a tissue with cells and you stretch that uh, tissue, so if you stretch this tissue on the inside outward, you give it a little bit more space. So this little area here, it's stretched outward. You're essentially expanding the area in which it has to divide and proliferate. This can uh, result in fast cell cycle reactivation. So if cell cycle is reactivated. And it makes sense because if you release you relieve the pressure on these cells, they can start to proliferate again and fill that space. Whereas compression rapidly leads to cell cycle arrest. So if you compress the space even further, I have my cells here, and I'm compressing the available space, or, you know, if it, it's going to really crowd them in to an even more confined area, and so that leads to arrest. And we know that, you know, there are all sorts of Force cues and signals that are happening, so they happen on each cell, but they happen across an entire population of cells. So a coordin it gets coordinated just by being a global signal. Our kinetic analysis of this response shows that cells have no memory of past constraints and allows us to formulate a biophysical model that predicts tissue growth in response to changes in spatial constraints in the environment. So it doesn't have a memory of what you know, what, what sorts of forces it's encountered. It's just basically a, a very expedient response. So what happens in, in res, uh, response to a single set of environmental conditions, and it doesn't really influence what happens after that. So, you know, if we think about our model of uh, differentiation waves, you know, we think about how this can happen in different ways in different parts of the embryo. And it could even happen, you know, across species. If you have changes to the embryo, you can have different types of tissue form based on those expansion and contraction waves. This characteristic biomechanical cell cycle response likely serves as a fundamental control mechanism to maintain tissue integrity and ensure control of tissue growth during development and regeneration. What they talk about here is they, they give the example of yeast, uh, Saccharomyces, where cell division is linked to cell growth through a size checkpoint during late G1 phase. And so this is, again, this, these phases of cell division. There's a checkpoint known in Saccharomyces during late G1 phase that links cell division to cell growth. So in other words, in yeast, as the cell size grows, there's a, there's a, a sort of a signal that gets uh, picked up at this checkpoint 
in late G1 phase, this is right before S phase, that tells it either to divide or not to divide. So it's a very simple uh, signal and a very simple system. You don't have a lot of cells interacting in an embryo. In this case, you just have cells that, you know, either get big and divide and then they live in these colonies. And it's, it's a different world for them. This size checkpoint term start in yeast is believed to ensure that only cells that have reached a characteristic size enter the cell cycle. It is therefore critical for cell size homeostasis. So again, in meat yeast, you have this model where if the cell reaches a certain size, it divides. If it doesn't, it doesn't divide. And it just basically regulates the size of each cell in that, in that colony. And so, you know, you have this uh, size regulation and this cell size homeostasis. Uh, however, it is not known how cells monitor their own size. So we don't know what the mechanism is for this. We only know that it exists, that there's this cell cycle sort of regulation. And there's the cell cycle regulation based on cell size. And we don't we know it's probably not actively measuring its cell size uh, in, in, in the way that you might think. It's just that maybe when it reaches a certain, you know, there's some cue that gets sent back to the uh, cell cycle that tells it to either divide or not to divide. It could just simply be that, you know, there, there's a pretty characteristic growth rate for cells. And so it operates within that regime with a little bit of noise. And there maybe isn't really an explicit signal. And it results in homeostasis. But in this case, we don't really know how cells monitor their own size. We don't know what kinds of cues are available. The situation is even less clear in mammalian cells. Although early studies in cultured cells argued for a size checkpoint similar to that of yeast, more recent reports instead propose the growth rate as a trigger for cell division. In this view, reaching a characteristic growth rate rather than a characteristic size triggers entry into S phase. So growth rate, of course, is a derivative of size if you think about it as sort of a continuous phenomenon. So let's map out what we have here. So we have G1 phase and we have S phase. G1 and S. In yeast, we know that there is this checkpoint, and it's based on cell size. And then in mammals, we know that there's sort of a, I wouldn't say it's a ch similar checkpoint, but it's based on rate. So in both cases, you have this basically yes or no signal, it's kind of like a switch, where it says it's a simple signal, it says, should you enter S phase or not? So the idea is that it enters S phase, either it enters S phase and S phase begins, or G1 continues and S phase is not entered. And so this has consequences for division. And then uh, thus it controls the rate of proliferation. So we know that, you know, growth rate is a little bit different than size. Size is just, you know, either knowing what the size is or, you know, having some signal that kind of is a proxy for size or just having a deterministic signal with some noise that matches the growth to a certain size. It could be a timer or whatever. In mammalian cells, there has to be a little bit more complex of a signal because it's dealing with growth rate, which is possible if you get signals from other cells in the embryo and know what, you know, what their position is, what their size is, or so, and so forth. The body of animals largely comprises cohesive tissues in which cells are not in isolation, but coupled mechanically through cell-cell and cell-substrate contacts. So we know that from our original model here of the embryo, we have all of these cells that are dividing, but they're in this substrate or in this, in this uh, matrix where they can communicate with each other and where they kind of have, you know, cues like density and, and chemical cues like that. So... So we have these very basic cues that can be used uh, by the cells. Spatial constraints from crowding, for example, limitations on available space due to the presence of neighboring cells, impose constraints on cell functions such as cell proliferation. So this is a tissue level feedback perhaps, uh, and they call this a spatial constraint. So they did some live imaging of cell cycle state of individual cells. And they use a model epithelium. And then they, they introduce some experimental perturbations and look at the results. Uh, 
So they either acutely removed a barrier to release spatial constraints at the edge of the model epithelium, or perform mechanical stretching or compression of the tissue substrate and manipulate spatial constraints directly. So again, they did these stretching and compression experiments like we saw in this example here, where you either push the cells inward and reduce their total volume that they can proliferate in, or you expand that volume and let them freely proliferate without any constraints, since we're isolating the cues that they're using through modifying the sort of space that they have. We show that proliferation rate in tissues is controlled by a mechanosensitive cell cycle checkpoint that monitors the space available to the cell at the G1S interface. So if we go back to our G1S interface, you monitor the available space around the cell, and that is sort of a proxy for growth rate, because if you have a higher growth rate, then there are more cells around you, there's a higher density of cells. If in, that could be a chemical signal being emanated from the cells and there could be like, you know, some sort of summation or integration of the signals, or you know, just simply knowing that like there are different uh, other types of signals you can use, like mechanical strain or whatever in the environment. So if you have a dense packing of cells, for example, there's a mechanical strain associated with that. There's a loose packing of cells. You have a mechanical signal related to that. And so, you know, Susan's work, I think, is key here because it gives us this sort of, um, it, it characterizes the mechanical environment. Using mathematical modeling, we can predict the tissue response to changes in spatial constraints and validate the prediction of the model that cell division is required for sustained invasion of a tissue into newly colonized spaces. So they grew an epithelial model tissue consisting of contact-inhibited, fully polarized, made in Darby canine kidney 2 cells against a removable barrier. So, and so they were able to use this removable barrier to do some of the experiments. To monitor cell cycle dynamics, we used a fluorescent ubiquination-based cell cycle indicator. Uh, after barrier removal, the tissue rapidly invaded the available space. And after a slight delay, cells behind the initial barrier also reactivated their cell cycle by entering S phase. So it's all about entering S phase. And that's the thing that creates this, the conditions for proliferation. And the more you can delay S phase, the more you can pull back or uh, stop proliferation. And the sooner you enter S phase, the faster you can proliferate. And so this is what they're observing here. This was accompanied by a noted increase in the space covered by individual cells, the cross-sectional cell area, called cell area, from the edge of the tissue reaching into the tissue. Interestingly, cells entering S phase, they entered S phase in all regions of increased cell area up to several hundred micrometers behind the initial barrier, whereas cells even further behind remained at a high density and did not exhibit signs of increased proliferation. So this is figure A. It kind of shows the cell cycle. So you have cells in SG2M phase in green, cells in GOG1 phase, cells in G1S phase interface. And so you have these different phases of cell cycle. You have S, G2, M, G0, G1, and then S again. It goes around in a circle. And the idea is that you have cells in different states. You know, you want to synchronize your cells at the beginning of an experiment, but they go through all these stages. And so to capture them at this G1S interface and then do the experiments there and focus on that part of cell cycle, you can then see what the collective effects, because you want them all synchronized so that you can have the collective effects of this phenomena to see what's going on. That's, that's, that's what we're trying to do here. Interestingly, in tissues, you know, cell cycle may or may not be synchronized. So you have cells in all different phases of cell cycle. And the question is, is that if they're not synchronized in, in, the, bio, in the body, and we do this in culture, we can see a very clear signal in culture, but in the body, it might actually be a little bit less uh, coordinated. But nevertheless, we see coordinated movement. So we can assume that there's something, or this, is a, this is a good model to use. Uh, so they basically have this barrier, this PDMS barrier. It's a type of material, type of uh, plastic, and then they remove the barrier. So they they pack the cells in, they sort of constrain them, and then they give them free space. And then the opposite is true. They move the PDMS barrier backwards, 
and they constrain the cell. And so they're actually able to do cell tracking here over time so they can actually get position, state, and area of cross section. This is how they do their measurements. They do this using microscopy. And then they show this invasion of the cells when the barrier is removed. So as the barrier, this PDMS barrier is removed, it opens up all this free space in black. And so you can see the invasion over 30 and 60 hours. This is basically cell proliferation. You see the green dots in here, which are the proliferating cells, and that's their uh, signal for proliferation. So you can see that there's some green spots over here, but mostly on the, on the, on the frontier. And we can see here in this graph G that in the G0, G1 phase, the cell area increases uh, almost linearly, maybe a little bit uh, higher than linear. And then it reaches the S boundary where the cell area sort of uh, it enters a logarithmic phase and it's pretty stable. And so what's happening here is in G0, G1, the cell size is increasing and the cell area is increasing, I guess. And then as it reaches that S phase, they start to divide. And so they have a much more regular size after that. And they're able to put all that extra uh, growth into proliferation instead of cell size growth. And so we have our external mechanical perturbation here in A. We have external forces being applied. And we see that then there's a relaxed substrate. And then we apply external forces. So we can see that some of these perturbations, there's some adaptation here. We have cell cycle arrest and we have the initial application of external forces. Then we relax the substrate and then we have cell cycle progression afterwards. So again, we have this, when we compress the substrate, we have cell cycle arrest. When we relax the substrate, we have cell cycle progression. So this is what we were talking about in terms of triggering these changes in cell in, in how cells how we enter S phase. And so we can actually do this with pharmacological cell cycle inhibition. So we can look at the relaxed substrate. If we inhibit cell cycle before S phase entrance, even if we have a relaxed substrate, we don't, do not see proliferation of cells. If we pharmacologically inhibit S phase uh, on a stretch surface, which is, of course, a different type of substrate, we still get no cell proliferation. We get, re we get proliferative conditions when we have, we release that pharmacological intervention. We get either a stretch substrate or a lax substrate. And we, in both cases, we get this increased proliferation. So I hope you learned something from that paper and hopefully we can apply it to some of our own work in the group. Thank you.